Welcome to the Raising Boys and Girls podcast. I'm Sissy Goff. I'm David Thomas. And I'm Melissa Trevathan. And we're so glad you've set aside a few minutes to spend with us today. In each episode of this podcast, we'll share some of what we're learning in the work we do with kids and families on a daily basis at Daystar Counseling in Nashville, Tennessee. Our goal is to help you care for the kids in your life with a little more understanding, a little more practical help, and a whole lot of hope. So pull up a chair and join us on this journey from our little yellow house to yours. The Raising Boys and Girls podcast is brought to you in partnership with Minnow. Minnow provides meaningful screen time and shared experiences for families to help you grow in your faith together. Check them out at podcast.gominnow.com. That's podcast.gominnow.com. David Thomas. Hey, Sissy Goff. I was about to say it's fun to see you, but we see each other every day pretty much. <laughs> so it's not fun to see me? Is no, that it's still saying? fun to see you. I'm still glad to see you. <laughs> glad to see you. Thank you. And we are excited to be with you all talking about balance, which I really was thinking with life mid and post pandemic, that feels more important than ever before. And so it feels really great that we're having this conversation around being a balanced parent. But as a person, because we love to talk about that too, David, what would you say helps you be more balanced? And I'm not even going to make the taco joke. (laughs) Thank you for passing on that for this episode. (laughs) (laughs) We know that's probably in the mix somewhere. Eating tacos helped me do everything. I would say right now, one of the things that's helping me be balanced is listening to different voices, whether that's reading books by different authors or listening to podcasts. I talked in an earlier episode about how my Enneagram teacher was challenging me in different ways, and she said this might be of interest to you as a one, so that it's good for ones to listen to other voices that you don't always agree with as an Mm. exercise in helping you extend more grace, because We know we're not so great in the extending grace department to ourselves or others. And I thought, wow, what a great intentional practice that is. And so I've been trying to be open to reading and listening to others' voices. And I think, obviously, that builds empathy in every one of us when we're thinking about life from another person's perspective. So what about you? What's helping you be more balanced these days? Well, I realized somewhere along the way, and it was probably when we were remotely working and counseling over Zoom, that I had to do something that marked the end of my workday or else my workday would bleed over into the rest of my life. So, and, and that's actually something I've heard a lot of kids talk about too, with parents working from home so much more, that they feel like it's bleeding over more. And so I think for any of us, but for me too, whether it's that I go on a walk or I play with Lucy intentionally, or I mean, whatever it is that I do, I need to do something that marks for me almost in a ritualized way the end of my workday so I can shut that door and then move into more personal life and the things that I want to do post-work because it just can be harder and and our devices make it harder too. So that has definitely helped me be more balanced. That's awesome. So what about kids? What would you say helps a parent be more intentional in terms of their sense of balance? I hear parents talking a lot about wanting to balance out time more. And we talked in another episode about, I think it's harder than ever to figure out time for families to just sit around the dinner table together because there's so many activities that are competing for our kids' attention. Obviously, that became easier to do when we as a nation passed through quarantine on the front side of the global pandemic. But thinking about carrying those practices into life after the pandemic when we jump back into more experiences that are pulling at our time and as the world's opening up safely in more ways. And I love when parents are wrestling through that in thoughtful ways, but I also hear a lot from parents about the challenge of balancing support. And I think mm-hmm. we ought to camp out there for a few minutes. And I think that shows up in the everyday of, okay, My kids are arguing. There's some sibling rivalry going on. Do I need to intervene and referee this moment, or do I need to wait it out and let them work it out? 
And it's not always clear. Our kids come home and made a bad grade and feel like their teacher was being unfair. And you're thinking, okay, do I need to help them shape an email to their teacher? Did you notice that I said help them shape an email to the teacher rather than us shape an email? And shape. Yes. Instead of do I need to direct or send. Absolutely. That's good. Or kids are reporting I'm not getting enough playing time in my sport and... Do I need to help them figure out how to have a conversation, thoughtful conversation with a coach where they're asking, what do I need to work on to get more playing time? Or do I need to just wait a little longer and let them get more uncomfortable in that Mm -hmm. space? And so I just don't think it's always instinctive of when we need to step in more or when we need to step out more. And, And yet I think that's a really important question to wrestle through. Mm. We, we challenge parents a lot about the importance of paying attention to not doing too much intervening or stepping in. And I think that's never been more important than in this day and age. I love what you just said, and I don't know that I've ever heard you say it before, but we have a dear mutual friend who used to be a counselor on staff at Daystar. And I remember when she was here, I think her supervisor or counselor had said this to her and it has stayed with me so much about we can't want something for someone more than they want it for themselves. And often we don't let kids get to a place of dissonance or discomfort enough that they move into wanting it, that we step in and intervene first. And we can be guilty of it. I can be, maybe you can't, I won't call you on it. But even as a counselor, I can want it more than they do. And so what does it look like to let them be uncomfortable enough to want it for themselves? I love that, David. I love that thought. I thought of an example of that. Tell me. When my daughter was in first grade, Her cubby was right above a little boy in her class. And for any parents who are listening who have boys, you know, we as boys can be a bit forgetful. And he managed to forget to bring sharpened pencils every day. And she, being a firstborn girl, always had her sharpened pencils on her. (laughs) And he got in the habit of saying, can you give me a pencil? I don't have mine Mm. today. And she would often voice how frustrating it was to be supplying him with his supplies and as firstborn girls will often do just not understanding why in the world you wouldn't come to class prepared (laughs) and I remember asking her what do you want to do about Mm -hmm. that and she could only say I want him to stop but couldn't brainstorm her way to how to make that stop and I remember after it had gone on for weeks not days, weeks Mm -hmm. of hearing her disgruntled reports about he's unprepared, but being unwilling to stop that pattern of behavior thinking, I just want to step in and make this wrong. I want to say, hey, knucklehead, bring your own stuff to class. We're not in charge of supplying your pencils, but realizing she needed to sit in that discomfort longer than I did to be able to get to a place of some good brainstorming. Yeah. And so what does it look like to hit that balance of letting kids sit in some discomfort to get to a place of being motivated to change. And that's going to look different for every one of our kids based on temperament. And I think it's going to look different, unique to gender too. In Mm -hmm. fact, will you talk a little bit about where you see girls and parents of girls getting stuck in support? I think as we think about girls and even what I think about that they're talking to me the most in counseling about at a certain age, it becomes about peer relationships. And every girl in some setting, whether she's homeschooled or in school, she is going to encounter another girl who hurts her feelings. It's just a part of them learning to navigate relationships and even conflict in relationships. And really, we want them to start doing that at early ages so they can learn healthy ways to do it. But it is going to be really hard for you. And as we talked about Kids Can Touch on Your Stuff, it's going to be especially hard for you in seasons of life where you struggled yourself with friends. And so when that happens, it's going to rise up in you to want to fix it. She is going to come home from school someday and say, Caitlin, who has been her best friend up to this point, told me she never wants to play with me again. Caitlin said, I'm weird. I'm not allowed to hang out with them on the playground anymore, whatever it is. And you are going to not only want to call Caitlin's mother and have a conversation with her, but you're going to want to say, now you go find Caitlin tomorrow at school and you tell her, and you're going to write exactly a script for what you want her to say to Caitlin. And of course you are, because that's the most natural thing in the world for you to want to do is to protect your child. 
And like we're talking about, you can't want something more for her than she wants for herself. Plus the fact, if you give her the words, she's not going to get to them herself. And I love, David, even when you talked about, Lily, you talked about asking her a question. That's where you started in that. And I think so often it brings up our own hurt or our own stuff to the degree that it's even hard to see our way to questions. I will never forget. I think Melissa and I were at a restaurant in town years and years and years ago, and I saw this mom of a girl I had counseled and I was standing near the check-in station, the hostess station, and she was standing a couple people away from me when she realized it was me, and she motioned me over. I can still picture us standing there. And she said, I could tell she was teary when I got over to her, and she said, Sissy, you're never going to believe what's happened. And I said, what? And she motioned to her daughter, and she said, we just broke up with her boyfriend. (laughs) Y'all hear that? (laughs) We just broke up with her boyfriend. And obviously, my first instinct was to want to have a counseling session right there in the restaurant to say there is no we in this relationship, and this is a problem in and of itself. But I think that's the thing. She probably felt so much anguish over watching that happen with her daughter that it felt like she had broken up with him too. You are not ever broken up with from your daughter's boyfriend. That is not a thing. Your daughter's friends can't reject you. It's going to feel like they have. And in those times, what we would say, and I'll just go ahead and preview what we would talk about. I think we talk about in the ages and stages episode, but with girls, I mean, really with both genders and where David's going to questions, we love questions. But with girls, my template relationally is to help girls think about what does it look like to be kind and strong at the same time. You're not writing the script for her, but you're having a template of, okay, what could you say to that friend that would be kind and strong? When Caitlin hurts your feelings and says you're not allowed to play with her, what can you say? Caitlin, I want to be your friend, but it hurts my feelings when you talk to me that way. That's kind and strong. We want to help empower them to be both because ladies that are listening, can you imagine how different our relationships would be as adult women if we had learned at 10 or 14 or even 17 what it looks like to have kindness and strength at the same time? Because I don't know about you. But I lean one way or the other still. I struggle with what it looks like to have a balance. Here we talk about balance. I struggle with what it looks like to have a balance of both. And so support often, I think, with girls in that situation is pulling back, having perspective. And if that means you need to say, honey, I can't even believe Caitlin said that to you. I'm so sorry. I'll be right back. I need to run to the restroom. And you go scream in your pillow or whatever you need to do. Pretend like... You can talk to Caitlin or her mother away from your child, something to process your own emotions and then return with empathy and helping her get to working her own way out of the situation. And I think with boys, it probably looks different than relationships, although there are boys that relationships are, they're going to come back with some of that pain too. The Raising Boys and Girls podcast is brought to you in partnership with Minnow. Did you know that Minnow has an award-winning children's Bible? Written by VeggieTales creator Phil Vischer, the Minnow Laugh and Grow Bible for Kids is more than a children's Bible storybook. It's a deep, engaging, and whimsical gospel experience. Each Bible story is vividly illustrated, takes just minutes to read, and includes a family connection to encourage readers to learn, talk, and pray together. Find out more at shop.gominnow.com. That's shop. Dot G-O-M-I-N-N-O dot com. I love that you talked about that balance of strength and kindness. I think mm. that's so important because the end of that story I told a little bit later is despite some practice and role playing and brainstorming that we did about how that could go down, she waited until the discomfort registered so strongly that she blew up all over that little guy. <laughs> Poor fellow. One day she yelled, why don't you come to class prepared like the rest of us? That is so funny. Yeah, which I think is such a picture of what you're talking about. You know, mm. that girls can hold that in for so long and then they either land over here on the way too strong side or what she was doing for so long was being too kind Mm -hmm. and too helpful in that moment. Whereas if she could have, I think she would say now in her young adult life, I could have gotten to a place quicker of being able to say, 
I'm glad to help you out one day, and then I won't be providing pencils for you for the yeah. rest of the year. That strength and kindness, kindness and piece strength. side by side. And Well, way to go for not intervening with the knucklehead. Well, I sure had thoughts of it. You know me. <laughs> the reformer. I want to make all things right in this world. But I think it is a trap for so many parents with kids of both genders and all ages to want to step in. And I think with boys, it can show up the most. I would challenge parents listening with his academics and his athletics. And moms who are listening, I'm going to pick on you for just a moment. But I would say I think there is a particular trap for moms with boys to get a little too involved in his academic life and not even realize that it's happening at times. In fact, over the years, I have with a lot of boys in my office asked this question, and I think boys think it's a trick question. They often look at me like, what am I supposed to say to this? But I often say, hey, tell me this, where is your mom in the house when you do homework? And boys often look at me like, this is a trick question. (laughs) And so many will say, Right beside me, of course. Like, isn't every mom sitting down beside you when you do homework? And moms listening, I want you to think about that for a moment. If your son comes home from school, unzips his backpack, and puts his books and notebook out on the table, and you immediately pull up a chair and sit down beside him, I want you to think about the message that you could be sending to him. I think a lot of boys get the message when that happens of, you're not focused enough, you're not smart enough, you aren't engaged enough, you won't do A, B level work. If I'm not here, there are a lot of messages that I think boys absorb in addition to, I think, absorbing the experience of, I can't do the work unless you're right here. And I want to say as a side note for any parent listening, I have worked with countless boys over the years who have learning hurdles, boys with attention deficit, boys who struggle more with learning. And I would say I believe this information is still true even for those boys. Even for those boys, my challenge to you would be, hear me say this clearly, I don't think there's a thing in the world wrong with sitting down next to a boy when he gets stuck in his academics as long as at some point we get up. We don't want to stay there, even if you have to make up something to do. You say, I need to go return some emails. I've got to finish a call. I need to start dinner, whatever it may be, because I want every boy to be on a long journey of becoming an independent learner. And if we're always seated beside him, we're training him on some level to be a dependent learner. And mom's listening. I've spent a lot of years on college campuses looking at colleges across the country with my kids. And I'm here to remind you, you know this already, but nowhere in this country is there a mother-son dormitory. (laughs) (laughs) You cannot go away to school with him. He's got to go away on his own and to know how to quarterback his own academics. So I want boys to learn what I call the struggle through of schoolwork to becoming an independent learner. And, And let me just say, I think boys are so vocal I mean, that's when they can get the most emotional. Like, this math is so hard. No one can do this many problems. You know, they fall out on the floor, collapse on the table, and we've got to let them work through some of that hard to get to that place of being unstuck that's part of that independent journey. So, Mons, my challenge would be think about getting up, even if it would end in him not finishing the work or refusing to do the work. And for those parents listening of boys all the way up to eighth grade, kindergarten through eighth grade, that is the best and in my mind most important window to be letting boys wrestle through and figuring out what good support looks like in his academic journey because back to colleges, no college is ever going to look at your fourth grade math scores. (laughs) So if he kind of drops off for a little while – In building toward independence, that's a good window to be doing it because obviously by high school, everything's on record. And so those listening with younger kids, focus in there. And dads, you're not off the hook. My challenge to you would be pay attention to how easy it can be to give too much athletic support. I have encountered a lot of what I once called chain link fence dads, dads who are like glued to the chain link fence at the baseball field, shouting instruction and commands and forgetting or losing sight of the fact that our boys already have a coach. 
and what they really need us to be is a champion. And men who are listening, I know exactly what that feels like. I know what it feels like to sit on the sidelines of a sporting event and have a lot of ideas or input, none of which is needed when my sons have good coaches who I want to be leading that space. And so my challenge to you would be pay a lot of attention to that being a place where I think we can get way too involved. I can't tell you how many boys over the years I have had say in my office things like, I don't like riding home from a game with my dad. I'd rather ride home with my mom. And that always breaks my heart to hear. And I usually ask some questions after that, and I often get a similar version of things like, because my dad is going to tell me everything I could have improved on or what I could have done better at or what I didn't do well. And, you know, in 25 years of doing this work, I have yet to meet a boy who loves to ride home from a game, particularly a loss, and be told everything he could have done better or did wrong in that ride home. And I've had boys say, I don't even love shooting hoops in the driveway with my dad because he'll turn it into a coaching session. He's going to correct my shot. He's going to correct my pitch. And men, think on what it looks like to just be a champion. That's a place where I think we can step in with too much involvement, too much support, and lose sight. And what I also think happens in that space of too much support is a great lead into, you previewed this well, Sissy, of just balancing emotion. I think we can get way too emotionally involved. In fact, you and I have a great friend who's the head of a middle school here in Nashville, and she will say to parents at the beginning of the school year and parent night, I've I've heard her repeat this multiple times over the years. Okay, here's what's going to happen. In middle school, your kids are going to be up and down and back and forth emotionally, and they're going to have a lot of up and down relationships and back and forth. And the tendency will be, For you to have a lot of emotion around that, your kids' relationships, and for your emotion to linger longer than theirs does, and that equation is off. It feels like going back to what you spoke to, like we can't care more. The equation's off in that space, so we would really challenge you there, and we're going to be talking forward about more ideas of what to do when we feel a lot of emotion rising up in us. We give you one quick one right now just to remind you that Timeouts are not just for toddlers. Mm-hmm. They are great for grown-ups as well. And that's a good lead-in into what I would say is our first intentional practice. And that is creating some space where you as a parent can go to work through whatever's going on inside of you in these different moments we've been describing as it relates to our daughter's relationships or our son's academics or athletics and any other space where you feel like you're getting triggered a lot that is a concrete space. In fact, we have a great blueprint for this. If you want to go back and listen to the Are My Kids on Track season in the second and fourth milestones, perspective and resourcefulness, we talk about how to create this space. It's in the book as well. And creating a concrete space where kids can go when they need to work something through, where parents can go when they need to work something through. And one of the things we talk about there that we'd remind you of again right now is that kids learn more from observation than information. They learn more about regulating their own emotions from watching us do it than from anything else. So having a space that we go to is a really important place to start. What intentional practice would you add? Well, I think as we're talking about all this, one of the things that I would need to also throw in is I think that kids who don't feel capable often feel more anxious. And I think that's boys and girls. And so I think sometimes when we step in, that's one of the things I talk about in Raising Worry Free Girls is that basically for kids to work through their anxiety, they have to do the scary thing. And when we step in and rescue them from having to do that, which we're doing when we do it for them, then it makes them feel often like they're not capable. And so in that, and and I asked this question in the book, and I think it's a great thing to think about. Well, two questions. One is, what are two things that you're doing right now for your son or daughter that they can do for themselves? And what are two things that you're doing for your son or daughter that they can almost do for themselves? Because in both things, it is so helpful for them. Actually, it's helpful for both of you. They're they're learning resourcefulness. They're learning that they're capable and competent. 
and you're learning a sense of balance and and you're providing more support because you can help them think through it. You can ask great questions like David talked about, and you can be there to support them in the process. And it's going to not only give you balance, but I think that resourcefulness, we just feel like kids are struggling to develop in ways they never have before. And so we want to do everything we can to help set that up. And I think one of the ways we can do that, a last intentional practice we'd recommend to you is, as a family, sit down at the table together at some point with a note card or a piece of paper and have everybody brainstorm on some coping skills. What are some ideas? Come up with three or four ideas that help you, if you go back to Are My Kids on Track and listen to Perspective, help you come down the perspective scale, help you be able to regulate yourself in a way that allows you to get back to who you want to be and how you want to be in different moments. And we have a blueprint for a more developed idea around this and and are my kids on track as well. But it's something so easy that you could do, even with kids who can't even write. They could draw pictures of the things that help them. They could draw a picture of their dog and petting their dog. They could draw a picture of throwing the tennis ball with the dog and going outside and throwing the ball for a few minutes. Different strategies that allow you to regulate yourself. And that's going to be different for every person. And part of why we'd recommend doing this together as a family is that it allows kids to see that this is grown-up work as well as kid work. This is something we'll be doing for the rest of our lives. And also seeing that if something doesn't work, part of having a resilient mindset is that if something doesn't work, then I want to replace that with something that could work differently. And so we may on occasion need to scratch something off our list or our note card and replace it with something else if we find out it's not as beneficial or we're not using it as often. But we're such believers in the importance of having a a running list at all times. And you could even hang that up in the space that I mentioned a little bit earlier because when we're elevated, it's sometimes difficult for us to think rationally. We might not even be able to remember the ideas that we once came up with, and having a list of those visually posted somewhere could help us get back to those good ideas a little more quickly. So as we're talking about all these things, we are sitting in the Daystar house, and maybe it's because I'm hungry, ready for lunch, but I can see this list of places that the kids go for dinner as a part of their group counseling, and it reminds me of a conversation I had with a mom once about balance that I thought was so wise, and she was a pediatrician. And I have a lot of questions about girls and weight and body image. And thankfully, I'm having more parents who are talking about helping kids learn what it looks like to be healthy and strong and getting off of the subject of weight. But I remember this mom using the word balance, and she said, It is so important to me to teach my child balance in this area too. And she said, and I've realized I have to have it, and sometimes I can struggle there. And so she said, I deliberately have started about once a month taking my kids to McDonald's. Now, not knocking McDonald's here. I think McDonald's is a great place. But she said, I just want them to be able to eat fast food at times so that it doesn't become some forbidden fruit in some way. And I want to teach them to eat healthy and what that looks like. And for us, just it feels like balance is being in both places. And and I think her comment in that moment came after me talking in a parenting seminar about if you struggle in this area, you're not going to be as balanced, and it's going to spill over into the lives of your kids. And so as we talk about being a parent is also looking at what that means about you as a person, you know, balance is so hard, and it's another one of those places we're going to blow it at times for sure. But circling back to so many of the ideas that we've talked about, I think we all need sounding boards, and we need accountability places, and we need to be talking together because Often the places we're not balanced are blind spots for us, and that's why we're not balanced. And so we need people we trust who can remind us of that. We need to be talking about it together. We need to be praying that God would bring those things in light of where we are too. And I think back to your idea, David, about a a contract as a family and talking together about things you want to be doing differently. I think it's a great thing to talk with your kids about. How can we have more balance? Because I think so often we even think about that idea and it feels like pressure and what we want it to bring is freedom. And we want there to be a sense of balance that feels like it just frees you up to be all of the things that we're talking about in the season, more connected, more free, more present. And that's really what balance should do for all of us. And so for us to get back there, 
I think it requires a lot of prayer, a lot of conversation, and we could say this on every episode, a lot of grace, because we're going to blow it at times too. So thank you for entering into this conversation with us, and we're excited about being with you soon for the next episode. And now Melissa's going to anchor us to some great truth. I'd love to tell you another grandmother story. She lived till she was 103, and on her 100th birthday, besides being a little mad at the Today Show that she wasn't placed on the announcements about who had turned 100, she did get over that, but we had a birthday party for her. She was born on Christmas Day, and all these people came, and she was in her glory. Oh, how she loved it. And while we were standing there, I heard my name. Melissa. It came out loud and strong. When she wanted me, she would put the emphasis on the me part. Melissa, come here. I knew what was good for me, and I went straight over to grandmother. And as I stood there, and I can see her right now in her dress and her twinkly eyes, and she took my hand and then she held it tight and she said, I love you. I pray for you every night. And then she squinted with those pretty blue eyes. It seemed like a glare to me. And she took her index finger and she pointed it at me and she said, you behave yourself. You be a good girl. I will never forget that. Because she was doing two things. When we're thinking about balance, she had the balance very naturally. She would hold my hand and say, I love you, and point her finger and say, behave yourself. Larry Crabb and Dan Allender have uh, both said that a child is often asking two questions. One is, am I loved? And the other is, can I get my own way? And they're asking them both at the same time. And I feel like my grandmother was saying, yes, you are loved. I'm going to hold your hand. And pointing her finger and saying, no, you cannot get your own way. I love in Matthew 10, verse 16, where Jesus, when he's sending the disciples out, he says, be as wise as a serpent and gentle as a dove. Be wise and gentle at the same time. Oh, hold their hands, but also point your finger because you believe in them and who they can be. Answer the question, am I loved? Oh, yes, you're loved. I'm holding your hand. Yes, you're loved. I'm gentle as a dove. I'm holding your hand. Can I get my own way? Nope. Cannot get your own way. And let me tell you, It is not a good choice to try to get your own way because I'm going to be as wise as a serpent as Jesus told his disciples. I love that. I think balance, when we think about it, is a balance of those two. And you may say, well, I've got it. I've got those two. I know that's what I'm supposed to do. I'm supposed to love my child. I'm supposed to give them discipline. I'm supposed to be strong with them. That I know now I've got that visual. I have to hold their hand and point my finger. But I want you to know it's not just get your balance and just get the thought. It's ongoing. If you ever just stood up, you could do it right now if you wanted to. Just stand up. Stand on one foot. Get your balance, stand on one foot. And what begins to happen is you don't just stand there. You start to sway. You start to lean different ways. You start to move. And that's what I believe when we're talking about balance, it's ongoing. It's not just, okay, I've got my balance in parenting. I know what to do. It is every day, every hour. You are balancing, and you're moving. You're moving around. In maintaining that balance that we all want, 
Many times it has to do with focus. And that's what Matthew 6, 33, it says, Seek ye first the kingdom of God. And all these things, all these anxieties that we have will be added unto you. In Romans 12, 1 and 2, in the message, it says, Okay, here's what I want you to do while you're trying to get your balance. God helping you take your everyday, ordinary life. You're sleeping, you're eating, you're going to work, you're walking around life, and place it before God. Fix your attention on God. You'll be changed from the inside out. Fix your attention. Focus. For several years, there was a group of us that would go on a sport fishing boat in the Bahamas. And I loved it until we went out into the open ocean and went fishing. Everybody else was real excited, but I would start to stumble around and then I would start to get really sick. So I would sit down usually on a bucket and I would focus and fix my eyes on something. And it may be a cloud or it may be something I could see on an island on the horizon, but I would fix my eyes. I would not move my head. Even when somebody had caught a huge fish and everybody was running around, I sat on my bucket and I focused. So I would have my balance, and so I would not get sick. All through the Scripture, the Word of God tells us to focus, to be changed, to fix our attention. So hold their hand and point your finger. Remember that it's ongoing every day, and focus. Keep your attention, keep your focus on Jesus. And I need to remember that God is holding my hand and he is saying, I love you. I love you. I am praying for you. And that he's also, in a loving way, pointing his finger and saying, I have such purpose for you. Trust me. The Raising Boys and Girls podcast is brought to you in partnership with Minnow. Minnow helps you make screen time meaningful for your family, which shows kids love and values parents' trust. Check them out at podcast.gominnow.com. That's podcast.g-o-m-i-n-n-o.com. It's our joy to bring the experience and insight we gain through our work beyond the walls of the Daystar House. Join us next time for more help and hope as you continue your journey of raising boys and girls.